Well, hello. It's good to be with you this morning, this afternoon, whenever it is that you're watching this. And even as we are not able to meet together in person, I'm thankful of this technology that allows us to worship together, to reflect together in some small measure. And even as we're not able to worship together in person now, we are still the church because the church is the people, not the building. And as the archbishops of Canterbury and York have reminded us, we need to continue to be the church and to pray, to love and to care for the vulnerable. So we're going to reflect on our scripture readings today together and let's begin with prayer and this is a prayer that I've adapted from the Lectio 365 app which if you are an app kind of person I'd highly recommend as a, a resource for sustaining your prayer life particularly in these times so let's pray together unshakable God you are our ever-present help in times of trouble amidst all the isolation grief and fear caused by this crisis renew in us your peace Restore to us your perspective and reveal to us your presence as we reflect upon your word now. Amen. We are living in unprecedented times, in unsettling and uncertain times, and we're probably all feeling a bit anxious and overwhelmed. And we're concerned. We're concerned for our health. We're concerned for the health of our loved ones. We may be worried about our work and our jobs, our income, what's going to happen in the world. And all of that concern is really natural and it's understandable. And it's not necessarily a sign of lack of faith to ask why. And so we may be wondering, we may be wondering why God hasn't shown up in a dramatic way and put an end to this virus. We might be praying for the tide to turn of the progress of the virus and not understanding why God has not stopped it as we've prayed. We might be praying like the psalmist from our Old Testament reading, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And we're crying out in honesty, in grief, and in pain. And that is okay, and that is something we need to do in this season. And then in our gospel reading today, we see a situation in which Martha and Mary are dealing with the death of a loved one and expressing their pain and their confusion. They asked Jesus to come. They sent a message to him. They expected him to turn up and to act. But he didn't turn up when they wanted or act in the way they expected. When the, he did turn up, the sisters said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They react in probably much the same way we might react to Jesus if, it's Jesus if he were to turn up today. So I think these readings are quite relevant to the situation in which we find ourselves. And I think we can learn from the way that Jesus responded to Mary and to Martha, and we can learn from the psalmist and the way they cry out to God. And we can use these Bible readings to help us gain some perspective on who God is and how he is at work in the midst of the pandemic we find ourselves within. And I wish I could tell you I had a neat and tidy answer for what God is doing, how God is at work in our current circumstances. I don't. And I'm not sure we're going to get entirely satisfactory answers this side of heaven. But that doesn't mean that God is not at work it doesn't mean that we don't worship a gracious and loving God. And I think there is encouragement and reassurance to be found in God's word. So let's look at that more carefully together. Now, we may all be familiar with the story of Mary and Martha. The more famous story is the one when they are carrying out their roles in their respective household, where Martha is busy in the kitchen and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. At that time, they knew their roles. They knew their place in the world. And yet, in this story that we read from John 11, things have become uncertain. They are in uncharted territory. As we begin the story, their brother Lazarus is ill, and so they send word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is ill. Now, notice they don't ask him to come. They don't tell him what he ought to do. But there is an expectation in the, the message. 
Lord, the one you love is ill. Surely you're going to come and intervene because this one you love is sick. But instead, Jesus delays. He delays for two days. And then by the time he actually gets to Bethany, to where Mary and Martha and Lazarus are, Lazarus is dead and has been in his tomb for four days already. And we might be tempted to think in these times that God not miraculously turning the tide of this virus means he doesn't love us. Just as it might have been tempting for Martha and Mary to think that Jesus did not any longer love them because he hadn't turned up. But that's not the case. Still, when Jesus arrives, both of the sisters have the same response. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's an expression of faith. An expression that if he had been there, he could have healed Lazarus. But I think there's also a little bit of rebuke in it as well. Where were you? Why did you not come? I don't understand. And we might all be saying that to God ourselves right now. Lord, you could act. You could bring this, to the vi this virus to a halt. Why haven't you do it? Why haven't you done it? I don't understand. And although... We might not see the answers in the way we want to see them. I would encourage you that we are to continue to cry out to God, to continue to pray. Because although we might not understand God not intervening, we might not understand his timing, just as the sisters in our story didn't understand Jesus' timing, Jesus had a greater plan, and I believe we can trust in God's plans as well. But I think it's also helpful to look at how Jesus did interact with the sisters in their situation of grief, how he responded to them. As Jesus interacted with the sisters, he did several things. He first reminded Martha of what she knew about him and about God and his plans. And then he joined in their mourning with them. And finally, he acted decisively and raised Lazarus from the dead. So first, reminding Martha of what she knew to be true about God. And I think that's something that we need to do for ourselves in this season as well. Jesus' interaction with Martha centers on a theological conversation about the promise of future resurrection. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do we believe this today? That this world is not all that there is, that as Christians we have a future hope which we can anticipate of living forever with God. Hopefully that is a comfort to us. But as we see in Martha's response, it may have been, and it may be to us today, a slightly cold comfort. It's something far away. What Martha is doing is mourning the loss of her brother right now. And so she responds, Lord, yes, I believe, but perhaps not with a whole lot of enthusiasm. And then she goes away to call her sister Mary. And when Mary hears that Jesus has come, she runs and she falls at his feet and says again, as Martha had, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And this time, rather than entering into a theological conversation, Jesus simply joins her in her grief. Verse 33 tells us, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And then he wept. He sat down with them and he cried with them. He mourned, even as he knew he was going to resurrect Lazarus and bring him back to life. Jesus shared in their grief. And sometimes, often, when we are grieving ourselves, that's what we need the most, is someone to simply come and be with us in grief. Not to tell us it's going to be all right, not to try and fix things, but just to be with us. Jesus did not act in the ways that Martha and Mary and the other mourners expected, but he did act. He reminded them of the truth they knew, he mourned with them, and then he raised Lazarus from the dead. It can be a temptation for us to think that we know what God ought to do and how he ought to act. 
And it's probably difficult for all of us to see any good reason for this coronavirus pandemic to wreak the havoc that it is in our world. And we are probably and we should be crying out to God to stop it. And it may test our faith that we cannot discern a way that he's doing that yet. And yet, I think that we can take comfort in the fact that we worship an all-knowing, wise and unchanging God. I believe that he knows all things and that he is all-powerful. And so I have to believe that even though in my human finite brain that I cannot understand a reason for this coronavirus pandemic, that I can see no purpose in it, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have one that his mind is greater than mine, and I need to trust in that. I don't always understand the way that God works, but I do believe and trust that we worship a good and gracious God. And even when we don't always understand, even when he doesn't show up in the way we think he ought to, we can trust that he is at work. So what then do we do? How do we deal with the anxiety, the worry, the confusion that we may be experiencing over the state of our world today? First, keep calling out to God. Ask him to intervene. Like the psalmist, don't be afraid to say, how long, Lord? How long do we need to wait? Prayer is an essential part of what it means to be a Christian of the Christian life. And in this season, we're recognizing the importance of that more than ever. Keep praying. Don't grow weary in praying. Keep crying out to God. And if you're struggling with faith at the moment, don't be too hard on yourself. Feel free to express those struggles and those doubts to God. He can hold them. That is what the psalmist is doing in our reading in Psalm 13. And we can do the same. And as he cries out and expresses and tells God his problem, we see at the end of the psalm he is able then to enter into praise. The psalm concludes, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. It's a trust that's not based on circumstances. There's a but. It's a trust that's based on confidence in God, how he's been faithful in the past, and how we can anticipate he will be faithful in the future. As we recall, as Jesus tried to help Martha do, how God has been faithful, what his plans have shown, what he has made promises to us, we can trust in him despite our circumstances. And then secondly, in these uncertain times when our regular rhythm of life is severely disrupted, it can help to establish new routines, particularly routine that helps us pray and stay grounded in our faith. It's called a rule of life. Orders of monks and nuns usually have a rule of life to uh, govern how they interact together. And this can help us in staying grounded in our faith. It's simply a flexible structure to help us grow more like Christ. And it's important to keep in mind that it is flexible because it will look different for different people and at different seasons of our lives. But I'm going to run through one that uh, has been created by our friends at All Saints Woodford Wells. It's a simple rule of life that has four points. Read, pray, call, and bless. So first, read. Start by reading God's Word. You might want to read a psalm a day. Maybe you're already using a Bible in one year reading plan. Maybe you just want to read a small portion of Scripture each day. But spend time in God's Word. Let Him speak to you through it. And then pray. Ask God to give you strength. Ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And then intervene and intercede in prayer for the world, our country, and those we know and love. And then after praying, think about calling. We need each other more now than ever. And many people aren't able to get out. Well, none of us are able to really get out and about as we normally would. So. Think each day who are one or two people that you might be able to call and encourage. And finally, to bless. What are the opportunities that you have to bless other people in your life? If you are still able to go out and get supplies, who are friends or neighbors or family members that you might be able to collect those for them to keep them safe? If you have financial resources, who might you be able to give to 
that might not be getting income in this period in their life. Again, ask God to reveal to you who in your life that you can bless. So read, pray, call, and bless. These are things that we can all do. We are living in uncertain and unsettling times, but we do worship a God to whom we can cry out and ask to intervene. We worship a God who can perform miracles, just as he did in raising Lazarus from the dead. We worship a God who is all-knowing and all-powerful, and we can trust him. And we worship a God who is personal, who will enter into our grief with us, just as Jesus entered into Mary and Martha's grief. So continue to call on him. Continue in prayer and in reading the word. Continue in calling and blessing one another and worshiping together, even as we are physically apart. Amen. Let's pray together. Unshakable God, you are our ever-present help in times of trouble. We come before you to bring our confusion and our grief and to ask how long. We come before you to remind ourselves of your faithfulness in the past as we look for you to show up in our present. We ask you to come and bring your healing to our world. We ask that you would reveal your presence to us, and as we anxiously look forward to the day when we will be able to meet again to worship together in person. In the meantime, amidst all the isolation, grief, and fear caused by this crisis, renew us in your presence, restore to us your perspective, and reveal to us your presence. Amen. So do keep well and keep safe. If you need anything, please do get in touch with Paula or I. If we can't help, we um, have connections of people who can. Uh, please don't feel alone and please do reach out and look after one another. Again, we're learning to do church in new ways, but we have a good opportunity to bless one another as we do so.